Well, let's remember to pray for our pastor tonight who uh, is probably mounting the pulpit to speak right now. He's had quite a schedule, uh, speaking in the morning, speaking in the evening, and uh, I hear things are going well. And so let's continue to pray for him. We are going to see a, a little two-minute video clip that will bring back to your memory the story of Elijah. By the way, the blue sheet, all my scriptures on the back there for easy uh, reading. And then on the front side, some of the things that you write down someday, I believe, you might use these to help a friend that might be in a time of discouragement or depression. And there are some things, I shared this with one person today already who's never been to this church. And um, you will use this. So uh, I know you don't usually take notes, but tonight might be something special. So our uh, little video clip here will introduce for us tonight. Your people have rejected your covenant, torn down your altars, and killed your prophets. I alone am left, and now they seek to take my life. How long will you people waver between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. If all, follow him. Anani Adonai Anani, Fiadu Ha'am Hazet. Ki ata Adonai ha Elohim. I will have my revenge, Elijah. By this time tomorrow, you'll be as dead as any one of those prophets. Why did you ever come here? A holy man barging in, exposing my sin and killing my son. Give me your son. Adonai Elohai Tashavna. I am the only one of the Lord's prophets left, but Baal has 450. Let them call on the name of their God. I will call on the name of the Lord. The God who answers by fire, he is God. Don't laugh, but Lucy and Lioness, I still look at, I went to an old file today and I found this exact uh, little cartoon that you can't read, so I'll tell you what's going on here. Lucy and Lioness are looking out the window and it's pouring down rain. And both of them are rather grimly looking at this scene when Lucy says quite melodramatically, Look at it, rain. What if it floods the whole world? Lioness responds, it will never do that, Lucy. In the ninth chapter of Genesis, God promised Noah that would never happen again. And the promise is the rainbow, Lucy. She responds, you have taken a great load off my mind. Nonchalantly, Lioness responds, solid theology has a way of doing that. <laughs> well, good word, Lioness, because tonight we are looking at that deeply emotional scene where our hero, Elijah, one of our favorite Bible characters, needs some sound theology as he falls depressed under a juniper tree, a little pine tree. And medically speaking, I would say, he needs a checkup from the neck up, if you know what I mean. And the great physician of heaven, God, has a prescription, an RX that is waiting for him. Please look down at verse one on your scripture sheet, and you will read that wicked King Ahab 
informs his equally wicked wife, Queen Jezebel, that Elijah had killed all of their prophets on Mount Carmel. By the way, that's a rugged piece of real estate. I've been there. I've, I've seen it. So, unbelieving woman that she is, Jezebel sits down and writes a poison pen letter to Elijah. What does it say? Look at verse 2. Then Jezebel sent a message to Elijah saying, So may the gods do to me, and even more, if I do not make your life as the life of one of them, those prophets of mine that are dead, if I don't do this by tomorrow about this time. Well, what do you think? It, it could have been a, a bluff, just kind of a threat. But it sounds to me like she put out a contract on his life. Jezebel says, I'm going to have you killed within 24 hours, and if that doesn't happen, may the gods that I serve do worse to me than I plan to do to you. Hmm. How did Elijah react to that? It's in verse 3. We read, he was afraid and he ran for his life. On your blue sheet, I've underlined those words. Ran for his life. Well, you say, where did he go? He went to the southernmost part of, of the land that he loved, Beersheba. You can't go any further south in Israel and still be in the state. It's just like from Toledo, Ohio to Cincinnati, Ohio, that's about as far as you can go and still be in the state of Ohio. And verse uh, 10 says this, that he left his servant there. He left his servant there. You see the last three words there? He left him there. And he himself went a day's further journey into the wilderness, deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper. If ever you have hiked or walked in the woods, you know that you can cover quite a bit of ground, especially if you walk fast. I take it that's what he did. I imagine that he stumbled through rough territory. He didn't find the path. He wasn't looking for a path. All he wanted to do was find a place to die. Who cares about the location when all you want to do is die? So look at verse 4. It says, that he came and sat down under a juniper tree, a pine tree, a broom tree, some people call it. And notice verse 4, he says, he requested for himself that he might die. He said, it's enough, Lord. Take my life. Take my life. You see, he had uh, Jezebel on his mind, didn't he? And so I want to ask briefly tonight, what were the causes for Elijah's discouragement, for his depression? You know, when you and I go through a time of kind of a low tide experience, uh, we're not clinically depressed, but we're just not having a good week or two. It's hard for us to get a, get a handle on that, to know what's going on here inside. Well, it seems to me that there might be five reasons for his discouragement. And I think the first one would be this, and there's a place for you to jot it down. He didn't think realistically. If you're taking notes, write that down. He didn't think realistically. If you're not taking notes, write that down. <laughs> okay? Great. You know, any kind of uh, person wouldn't have given much credence to the words of a, of a Jezebel. She was no talk. Uh, no action, especially after that discouraging defeat that she just had on Mount Carmel with all those prophets. She was just kind of trash talking. When Sherry and I lived in Texas, uh, they, they talk about a man like that. They say he's, he's all hat and no cattle. You know, he's all hat and no cattle. Well, that was Jezebel. Um, he shouldn't have taken her seriously. But not thinking realistically, and I notice here, he failed to call on the Lord. There's not one word here of prayer. 
Not once did he fall down and say, Oh God, be my shield and defender. Help me. Help. Not one word. See, realistically, I'm saying that he should have considered why, why God has more for me here than to die on the foothills of Mount Carmel. He has more for me than this. But he didn't think realistically. Ah, but there's another reason for his depression, as far as I can see. He separated himself from strengthening relationships. He separated himself from strengthening relationships, and that's a cause for depression. Uh, notice it says, uh, he went into the wilderness, verse 4, and sat down under a juniper tree. And I want to say tonight that um, most beds under juniper trees are single beds. Um, most depressed people are alone, and they're alone more than they should be. They, they eat alone, they, they sleep alone, they drink alone, they live alone. But notice, Elijah left his servant there. Look at the last part of verse 3. It closes with those words. He left his servant there. And he himself went a further day's journey into the wilderness. He separated himself from strengthening relationships. But the third possible cause for discouragement was this. He was caught in the aftermath of a victory. The aftermath of a victory. You remember that just one chapter back on the mountaintop of uh, Mount Carmel there. Let God who is God answer by fire. And God did. And it was a tremendous victory on that mountain. But on the heels of that great victory, he comes down from the mountain and he's vulnerable. He's vulnerable. You've heard it before. Maybe you need to hear it again. We are most vulnerable after a time of, of great victory or success or happiness. Or maybe even after a wonderful weekend when we had fun with our family and we did some things outside and Monday comes. And that's why many people call Monday Blue Mondays. Blue Mondays. Back in the 1800s, uh, a great preacher by the name of Charles Spurgeon used to teach a class of boys that were going to go into the ministry. And he warned them. Spurgeon said, never resign on a Monday. Never resign on a Monday. Why? Because a minister will often feel low after the high on Sunday. You see? Or, like for us, it may be uh, the time after uh, Christmas and the bills start coming in from Visa, and we have that low time, especially during the colder months of the year. John Steinbeck wrote the book, maybe you read it in high school. He entitled it, The Winter of Our Discontent. The Winter of Our Discontent. It wasn't the spring, it wasn't the summer, it was the winter. After the, the blooding, uh, the blossoming, and the blooming, after the activity of summer and, and a vacation and all those exciting moments, after that, the sameness sets in. Days come in daily doses, and uh, discouragement many times comes in. So, after a high, there's a low, and the vulnerability of our lives is increased uh, when we are at a low following a high. So Elijah was there in the aftermath of victory. But fourthly, notice this, don't miss this. He was physically and emotionally spent. He was physically and emotionally spent. Don't discount this, please. He was exhausted. He was a tired prophet. I want to say that that men and women of God get tired. And this man had been at it for a long time. 
There's an old Greek proverb that says, you will break the bow if you always keep it bent. You will break the bow if you always keep it bent. And you know what that means. Last night I came home. By the way, Sherry, you're getting to know her. 99% of the time, she is uh, bubbly, effervescent, happy, uh, never sad. And when I came in last night, I knew something was wrong. Uh, she even snapped at me last night. And I uh, walked up to her and I said, honey, what's, what's wrong? And with tears in her eyes last night, she said, Bob, I am just physically exhausted. She's been caring for grandkids for the last three months, driving down to Columbus, where they live, and their mother is having some uh, personal issues, and so that's what Sherry's been doing. She comes back on a Wednesday night just to be here, but uh, she said, it probably wouldn't be good to talk to me tonight, Bob. <laughs> So I made her a little something to eat and she went to bed. But uh, she had that low tide experience. We all get that. And so what we're saying here is if you keep that bow strong, it'll break. And that's Elijah. He was physically and emotionally spent. Number five, he submitted to the beast of self-pity. He submitted to the beast of of self-pity. You see it come out in his words. Look at the middle of verse 4. He says, Lord, it's enough. It's enough. Take my life. Take my life. I'm not better than my father's anyway. Well, I would like to ask, who said he had to be? Who said Elijah had to be better than his dad and his granddad? Well, he was caught in that aftermath, and he submitted to the beast uh, and, you know, Pastor was speaking about this last Wednesday or last Sunday. Remember when he was talking about the, the if-onlys of life or the what-ifs? We do that. If I had only gone to that college, uh, if I had only married that person. So he submitted to the beast of self-pity because he was really tired. And he felt a failure, and feeling a failure, he slumped. All right, folks. Let's get off that subject here. We've analyzed. Let's see how Dr. God comes into the picture and gives this dear prophet just the Rx, just the remedy that he needs. And some of these things you can share with a friend today. I shared them today with someone who doesn't even come to this church. And so I think these things will help you. God's therapy, God's Rx, what was it? Number one, he allowed him rest and refreshment. He allowed him rest and refreshment. Verse 5 says, he laid down and slept under a juniper tree. And behold, an angel was touching him and said, arise, eat. And he looked, and behold, there was at his head a bread cake baked on hot stones, a jar of water. Wow, what a marvelous catering service right there in the middle of the wilderness. Right there, a fresh jar of water, a nice hot pan of biscuits, fresh from the oven of God's own kitchen. Perfectly timed, piping hot. That's just what he needed. And it says in verse 6 that he ate and drank and he laid down again. Hey, we've done that, haven't we? we? We come to a point maybe in the middle of the day where we're feeling a little blue, a little down, and we say, you know, I think I'll feel better if I eat some comfort food. And so we make some mashed potatoes and gravy, and boy, that tastes so good, and we take it in, and we love it, and then we say, you know, I just feel like going, laying down for a while, going to sleep. We've done that. We do that. Uh, by the way, you don't find the Lord uh, interrupting him. You don't see the Lord uh, preaching at him. And you don't find the Lord saying, why? Have you ever walked up to a friend, maybe a Christian friend, and 
you had enough courage to say, you know, I really am struggling with discouragement these days. And then have that person say, well, why? Why? That really helps. Or, what do you have to be discouraged about? Why, compared to you, oh, don't say it. Don't say it. Or, even worse, why, you ought to be ashamed of yourself. Hey, you have a testimony to uphold, and if people could see you in the pit, that would be terrible. Now, verse 7 says, Arise and eat. Arise and eat. And he served them a great meal. Verse 7, the angel of the Lord came the second time and touched. Oh, oh look what happens here. You're going to have seconds. You just ate. You took a nap. You're going to have seconds. Touched him. The angel touched him and said, Arise and eat. The journey is too great for you. You need some more food. You need some more nourishment. Forget Jenny Craig. Forget Weight Watchers. You're going to have some more food. And verse 8 says, so he arose and ate and went in the strength of that food for 40 days and 40 nights. And women to this very day are looking for what that recipe was that allowed a man to go 40 days and 40 nights without eating. Wouldn't that be great, girls, to find that recipe? And it says in verse 8, he went all the way to the mountain of God. God allowed him rest and refreshment. I recently read a great comment from a man that I want to share with you. He said this, the Bible says the God of Israel neither slumbers nor sleeps, but that doesn't mean we don't have to. That doesn't mean we don't have to. He said, let me say it this way, sometimes a good long night's rest is far more spiritual than another hour spent in prayer or in the Bible. Um, he says, but we have become so compulsively utilitarian that we scarcely hear, see, or feel the world around us without having to attach a purpose to it. He said, if we at least cannot have times where we do something totally purposeless, it's because we really don't believe in the sovereignty of God. He goes on to say, is it so small a thing to have enjoyed the sun, to have loved, to have laughed, to have lived? Is it so small a thing to enjoy our days and to enjoy our God and to enjoy who we are? Is it so small a thing to be grateful and happy and to be at peace with ourselves and with our God? Is it so small a thing to feel fit and energetic and wonderfully alive? Is it so small a thing to fly a kite with your child or take a walk or play catch or wrestle on the lawn with your grandkids to tickle and be tickled until you're out of control? Is it so small a thing to make our days count rather than to count our days? I think life had tumbled in, caved in on Elijah so that everything was important and enough was never enough. And life became grim and it lost its fun. It lost its delight. So God allowed him rest and refreshment. Wow, what a great prescription. And then number two, God communicated to him tenderly and wisely. God communicated to him tenderly and wisely. Look at verse 7. Look at these tender words. The angel of the Lord came and touched him and said, Arise and eat, because the journey is too great for you. Tender words, gracious words, gracious invitation. Then verse 9, it says, So Elijah came to a cave and lodged there, and the word of the Lord came came to him. What does it say there? It says there in uh, the verse, I have been very zealous. But before he said that, he came to the mouth of the cave and he said, Elijah, what are you doing here? Notice God doesn't say, what are you doing there? He said, what are you doing here? Giving the impression that God was there in the cave with him. 
And when you go through hard times, it's good to know that God just doesn't say, what, what are you doing there? He says, what are you doing here, Elijah? And the implication is God is, God is right there with you. So he says, what are you doing here? And so look at the response. Elijah said, I've been very zealous for the Lord God of hosts, but the sons of Israel have forsaken your covenant. They've torn down your altars. They've killed your prophets with the sword. And I alone am left, and they're seeking my life to take it away. He's, he's depressed. He's despondent. He's even angry. But you've got to see verse 11. You've got to see verse 11. God said, go forth and stand by the mountain before the Lord. And behold, the Lord was passing by, and uh, the wind was blowing and breaking in pieces the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after that, an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire. Mount Carmel variety. But the Lord was not there and after the fire there was a still small voice Elijah was looking for the God of wind the God of earthquakes the God of the fire but God just was there in a still small voice one translation says a gentle blowing a gentle blowing. Hey, I want to say tonight that um, discouraged people are fragile people. They're not rugged people. They're like delicate pieces of, of fine china and they need to be handled gently, not slapped in the face. You don't have to raise your voice to a despondent person to get their attention. They're fragile. And God says in verse 13, what are you doing here, Elijah, not there, but I'm here with you. God spoke so carefully to him. And Elijah answers in verse 14, same song, second verse, I have been very zealous for the Lord, but the sons of Israel have forsaken your covenant. They've torn down your altars. They've killed the prophets, and I alone am left. Emphasis on the word alone, 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 alone. There's nobody here that's doing the job. I'm the only one left. Lord said, hey, Elijah, I have 7,000 in Israel that haven't bowed the knees to Baal. I have thousands, guy. You're not alone. You're not alone. You see the therapy? The Lord is gentle. The Lord doesn't interrupt him. The Lord listens to him, even when he says the wrong things. I alone am left. I alone am. He said that twice. God didn't crack him on the back of the head. He didn't wash his mouth out with hyssop. And I want to say to husbands, I want to say to wives, that sometimes a husband, sometimes a wife, has to give their partner the okay to have a low tide experience. Like with Sherry. Just give that person room to have a low tide experience. And you know, sometimes they even say the wrong things. When Sherry and I have had discussions sometimes, I've said things that are wrong, she just let it go. She said things that were wrong, I knew it, she knew it, but give your partner the opportunity for a low tide experience, we all have that. So God allowed him rest and refreshment, he communicated to him tenderly and wisely, and finally, don't miss this, he gave him a close personal friend. He gave him a close personal friend. Verse 19, he departed from there and he found him Elisha. Oh, notice carefully, it's Elisha, another man. He found the man that not only had a name like his, but but a spirit like his. And he became a friend. Elisha did. And the chapter closes with those words in verse 21. 
those last words. Then he arose and followed Elijah and ministered to him. That is to say, Elisha ministered and followed Elijah, this worn out prophet of God. In the chapter, in the story, end of discouragement. You do not find another day in his life like this. I don't mean to say that he never had a difficult day, but never as deep as this one. God gave him rest and refreshment. God gave him communication, and God gave him a friend. And I want to say tonight, oh, for the joy of having a friend, even if it's just one, a friend that believes in us, a friend that encourages us. Thank God for that one. Sometimes you only need one. When I came out of the hospital years ago after the shooting, my best friend Barry would call me and say, hey Bob, you wanna do this? Do you wanna do that? And I just said, you know, I'm just kinda of recovering here. And well, Bob, what's wrong? We used to do that. Well, it's a low tide experience. I wasn't angry. Uh, strangely enough about the person that pulled the trigger but um, I just had to get back on my feet and I just needed a low tide experience it passed you know the Bible says and it came to pass why did it come it came to pass and it passed but give people the benefit of a low tide experience I want to say tonight that there are hurts and longings and pains in this congregation, the likes of which, and I've only been here six months, you would never believe. But because we are given to surface relationships, we skate along, we dance along, never touching a person's life deeply or allowing them to touch us. So friends, members, may we please be open enough and realistic enough and to care enough to say, I love you. I care about you. I'm interested in you. Let's get together. And so I'm saying, will you listen? Will you listen to that still, small voice? that still small voice this evening and ask yourself what, what is God whispering in my ear? What does the gentle blowing say? I'm going to have a prayer here and I think I'd like to just dim the lights a little bit there James and um, let's stand for prayer okay? You know, I ask myself, do I really care? <clears throat> do I really care about who's seated around me this evening? Do I care about that person whose life, if I touched it, might begin to bleed all over me with the pain and the hurt of reality? Oh, God, make us see. You know, this message tonight was not intended to fill a notebook or to fill in words. I suppose if anything it was meant to uh, break our hearts. So let's pray. Our dear Father, we come together this evening to express to you our own individual need and our love for you. And suddenly, Lord, at the close of this message, we're, we're stabbed. Uh, eyes wide open with reality. God forbid, Lord, that we become just a heady and a high-minded classroom of people. I pray that the doctrine that we learn will reach deep into our hearts and enable us, Lord, to stand it when the other person next to us opens up his life so that we can without shock, without offense, 
be able to listen to them and as the Bible says as in water face reflects face may we enter in to that relationship and help in the healing of that person Lord help us listen to your promptings in the days ahead and we pray this in the strong name of Jesus Amen. Folks, go ahead and be seated. We'll turn the lights. I wanted to save a couple minutes for you because some of you could come to this microphone right here and you might say, hey, I have a friend that went through this or maybe I had an issue a few years ago or here's a lesson that Bob overlooked here in the chapter. In this verse, I see something a little different that might encourage you. So I wanted to leave uh, a few minutes, and we do have a few minutes, um, because I think I can learn from some of you tonight that say, you know, I know what you're talking about. I know what it is to, uh, to be so exhausted, and I know what it is to, to cry. I said to someone today who uh, lost her husband, I said, no one can say I, I know what it's like. I said, no one knows what it's like for you to walk into your home alone without him. And there are people here tonight like that. And I can't say, I know, I, I don't know. But I just want to be someone that can, that can hug you and to speak encouragement. You know the verse we always use to tell people to come to church, forsake not the assembling of yourselves together? We leave out the last part that says, encouraging one another. It's not just going to church, but I really come here every Sunday, every Wednesday with, how can I encourage somebody? It might just be a, a good hug or a nice handshake. You never know the condition of people when they walk in here, especially on a Sunday morning. Maybe some of you have just something to share and uh, would like you to do that. Um, I haven't got the cut sign yet, so I think we're okay. Uh, you folks have had stories, you've been through things, you know people, and maybe you could give me some things to write down here, okay? Feel free to do that. Just the microphone set up there. We can all hear you. Yeah, Mary? Sure. Right. That's that's great. Thank you, Mary. I just remembered that Lonnie told me something, I think last Wednesday night. What, you and another person were in a store or a place and you went up to people? What, was that you? I like that story. Stand up and tell that, okay, Lonnie?
Mm -hmm. Great, that's wonderful. I loved it when you told me that, Lonnie, the other day. Uh, you know, some of you think, well, Bob, you, you easily witness to people and talk to people. But I'll tell you, sometimes, most of the time, it, it doesn't work. Uh, I was in the emergency room again yesterday. Not that it was a real emergency, but this thing had uh, bursa, bursitis. And I never had that before. And the doctor drained uh, two syringes on it. And uh, the nurse came in. Uh, but I'm thinking, can I do a witness here somehow without being awkward about it? So I, I tried this approach. The nurse came in. I said, you know, my problem is, and by the way, bursa the, on the elbow usually happens to school kids because their elbows are on the desk. So here was my approach. I said, you know, my problem is I'm a left-handed pastor, and I'm writing my notes for a sermon, and maybe that's it. To see if she might say, like, oh, what church? Or, oh, you're a pastor. She didn't say anything. So that's where, where you had to leave it, where you had to leave it. But then there are times also where I've missed opportunities. And I said, oh, what am I thinking? You know, we've had uh, a grandson, seven-year-old, with us a couple of days this week. I got saved when I was six. And I said, Bob, you have never talked to your grandson, and he's sleeping in your house tonight. So uh, Emerson and I talked for about 45 minutes. And uh, I explained the gospel story, which he had never really heard before. And I said, Emerson, I, I want you to think about that. And if, if you're ready tonight, we can do that. But if you're not, we would just, just say, I need to think about it a little longer. But I said to Sherry, why have I never thought about going to Emerson, my own grandkid? So we had a great time last night. We really did. Yes, we've been praying for you. Yeah, 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 yeah. Mm -hmm. You're right. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah.
Yeah. All right. Yeah. Yeah. That's, yeah. Very good, very good, very good, very good. You know, someone said to me last week, uh, uh, he's always here at church, he said, you know, I don't think we realize here what, what we have. When you think of it, our pastor and junior, Juan, what he does with the kids, uh, you don't see it. I was talking to him on Monday, and I said, you know, you brought the kids up here Sunday, and it was eye candy for us, eye candy. It was great to see these kids, these little kids that we see in the hallway, but we don't know what in the world they're doing while we're out here. They're being nurtured in a, in a great way, and we don't realize sometimes what we have musically, theologically, preaching, and, and a wonderful, loving congregation. I, I just want to thank you for the privilege I had, you know. I wandered in here in August and hung around, and the pastor said, you know, I'm either going to have to get a restraining order on you, or I'm going to have to hire you. So, so he did. And uh, so I had my six-month review last week. And uh, he said, okay, you, you can stay. So, and then for tonight, he said, if you mess up tonight, that's it. That's it. So it's on film. He'll, he'll be able to see that. Um, incidentally, if you find a friend that's discouraged or down, you can go in a couple weeks to YouTube and just type in the message, and the whole thing will come. The PowerPoints will come, message, uh, the outline, and that, that's a good resource for you to give to a friend. Well, okay, folks, you've been, you've been wonderful, and uh, the pastor would be remiss if I didn't ask for a dollar, I think I can do that. And uh, God bless you. And as pastor would say, say something good about the church. Say something good about your God. Say something good about where you're going. We're in the land of the dying on our way to the land of the living. So thank you, folks. <clears throat>